Well, good morning and welcome to Hillsboro UCC, uh, the church on the corner of 5th and Main Street in downtown Hillsboro on this, the third Sunday of Epiphany. Welcome old and young, queer, straight, doubting, believing, saint, sinner, wall builders and ceiling smashers, or a little bit of each, depending on the context. Welcome you who come rejoicing today Welcome you who come burdened and heavy laden with grief. Welcome if the world is getting you down. And welcome if you see good news breaking out all over. Welcome to people of all ages, genders, all body shapes and sizes, all physical, mental, and emotional abilities, all economic circumstances, alos con documentos y los sin. This is where we practice heaven, by being here, all together, in community, seeking connection, listening closely, honoring difference, closing up distance, overcoming the sin of separation, not with a shallow peace purchased cheaply, but with a deep communion brought through the slow work of God on our lives. I invite you as you come to, to sign in on our digital visitor uh, pad um, to share uh, this bright spot on your socials. If you'd like, text a friend, invite them to join us if you'd like. Um, I am Reverend Adam Hange. I'm the pastor here at Hillsborough First Congregational UCC, and I am so glad that you are worshiping with us today. We are an open and affirming global mission and immigrant welcoming church of the United Church of Christ and as we prepare to enter this time of worship, I have just a few short announcements to make before we begin. First, I'd invite you to, to like our video and to join in uh, by chat or comments and let us know you're here and where you're visiting from. Um, and also invite you to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see this and other content as it becomes available whenever it's most convenient for you. If you're interested in finding out more about our church, I'd invite you to check out our website at hillsboro-ucc.org, and you can find out more about our parent denomination, the United Church of Christ, at ucc.org. You can follow along today in our uh, digital bulletin, and it'll have all of the, the readings and music notes and things there, so uh, I'll link that alongside of the video here. Um, today is also a very special day when we practice being Congregationalists together. Um, joining together in our annual meeting. So immediately after this service at 1130, uh, members and friends and visitors are all welcome to join us on Zoom 
Um, the link will be shared alongside the video as well and in your digital bulletin. Um, but we will gather together to celebrate the past year of leadership through these unprecedented times. And then we'll welcome new members, uh, new leaders to our boards and officially vote to accept them and their nomination uh, for those leadership positions. All are welcome. All have voice. Uh, members have vote. But uh, we invite uh, especially our members to come and add their vote of support for those who are volunteering their time and their talents um, for the continued ministry and mission of our church in this coming year. Again, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Now let us quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and center ourselves in God's peace. call to worship. We gather in response to the call of God's love, thankful that someone cared enough to share good news with us. May we be compassionate enough to share this divine presence with others, for love, when shared, is not divided but multiplied. Lord, love, when given, is not diminished but expanded. So may our gathering beckon and welcome those near and far to know the same love and divine presence. Now, let us rejoice together in joyful song. Let us pray. From the deep within us we know of a loving presence. All around us we see glory, beauty, life, and light. We have no words for what we experience, so we cry out, God, in this moment of worship may that loving presence grow deeper. May our awareness of the divine presence around us grow more intense, and may we gathered now 
Learn to pay more attention to God. God of love and life in this moment of prayer, be more and more in us that we might live more and more in you. Amen. Prayer of Confession. Holy One, what a blessing and privilege we share here in this sacred space and among this loving community. But like Jonah, we sometimes are jealous of what we share here. We know that others are longing and thirsting for what we know and experience. Forgive us our reluctance to open our doors, open our hearts to others, some like us, some not. We repent of our hesitation and unwillingness to bear witness to those who, who we consider strangers and even enemies for fear they might just become friends. Amen. The one who calls us to this place calls us to reconciliation through grace. God will not deny a repentant heart or an open spirit. Know that you are forgiven and walk in the new way that is made known to you in God's love. Amen. morning is from Jonah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 verse and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. The second reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little further. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boats mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Our witness of the Spirit is from Madeline Delangle. We draw people in Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and or how right we are, but by showing them a life that is so lovely that they want with all their heart to know the source of it. And now will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our help and our Redeemer. Amen. Over the last three weeks, we've seen some of the worst and, I believe, the best of our nation. Someone shared three pictures of our nation's capital over the last three weeks. Wednesdays, and one was a picture of the Capitol under siege during the insurrection on January 6th. Another was the vote of the House for the impeachment of President Trump. And a third, 
was the inauguration of Joe Biden as our current president and Kamala Harris as our vice president. Over the past three weeks, this nation has gone from violence and destruction to the peaceful transfer of power, but not without some anxiety about whether that would actually transpire. I don't know about you, but I feel like I've been holding my breath and then finally I'm beginning to breathe free again. This past Wednesday, a new day dawned at the inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris. And our new president delivered a speech that was more than a speech. It was a sermon quoting St. Augustine and referencing more scripture than many mainline Protestant pastors will preach on Sunday morning. It was less about policy or a particular vision for the future, so much as it was a plea for a new beginning. He said in his speech, let us start afresh, all of us. Let us listen to one another, hear one another, see one another, show respect to one another. And together we shall write an American story of hope, not fear, of unity, not division, of light, not darkness, an American story of decency and dignity, of love and of healing, of greatness and of goodness. May this be the story that guides us, the story that inspires us. Many in recent days have called for and prayed for the healing of our nation and its divisions, the coming together across cultural and political divides. And I believe we need healing, and I pray for that healing. And let us just for a moment, let us acknowledge how very challenging that will be, how hard it is for people to come from across the political spectrum to speak to one another and find common ground. And how necessary truth-telling and accountability are first in that healing process. Yes, we pray for a renewed civility in public discourse. And let us also admit that for some on one side, there are issues that appear black and white, with little room for compromise or negotiation. The black gay poet of the civil rights movement, James Baldwin, once said, we can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. We would be naive if we didn't admit that there are fundamental differences in point of view. And while voices from across the political spectrum have called for one another to lower the temperature and let go of the rhetoric of division and return to a constructive dialogue, we must acknowledge that is easier said than done. Charles M. Bao expressed it well when he wrote in an editorial for the New York Times this week. He said, How is it that people of good conscience and good faith are supposed to make common cause to find healing and unity with people who have demonstrated their contempt for the equal humanity of others? Where is the center point between my determination to be free and your determination to contain or constrict that freedom? I still think about the children separated from their parents at the southern border and the children kept in cages. I think about the Trump administration arguing in court that those children didn't need toothbrushes or soap or the lights turned out at night so that they could sleep. I still think about all those who died in custody and all those who have not been reunited with their families. I cannot forget that. It's hard to forget these kinds of differences and to move past them. And on the other side, I know that there are people who love Jesus, who read their Bible just like I do, yet disagree with much that has been done through this last administration, but cannot vote for someone who supports 
women's free and safe access to abortion, even in the case of rape or incest. While my soul stirred at this week's calls for hope and unity, we must have no illusions about how hard the work of healing divisions will be. It will be work. It will be all of our work to do. It's one thing to disagree with people out there, but it's particularly difficult when we see and experience the fault lines of division separating us from those we love most, from our family and friends and neighbors. As I've been thinking about and praying through this week, I've been wondering, how do we heal? How do we begin to heal the divisions that we see today? How do we even begin to bridge the distance between people who seem to be living in what almost appears to be wholly different realities, shaped by cable news and social media? And is there anything, anything at all, that our sacred scriptures and religious traditions might offer us to help us navigate these stormy waters of these tumultuous days? Well, of course, I believe there is. And today we read these two texts, two different fish stories, in fact. And I, I believe they may offer some wisdom and insight for this moment. First, we read of the call of the disciples in Mark chapter 1. As we've read over the past few weeks, you may recall that the author of Mark opens by quoting the prophet Isaiah, telling of a messenger that will go before the promised one, and then introducing John the baptizer as that messenger. And then Mark tells of Jesus' rebirth at baptism in the Jordan River, and then his testing in the wilderness. And then now today we come to this passage when we read about the beginning of Christ's Galilean ministry. Our passage speaks of Jesus passing by some fishermen at the lakeshore, passing by as they were casting their net into those waters of what is now modern-day Lake Gennesaret. One imagines the feel of the stones beneath his feet, the sounds of water lapping on the shore, and the smell of fresh water, the smell of fish. And Jesus sees Simon Peter there, and Andrew and says to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Together they walk further around the lake until they come upon another boat or, or several boats. The family business with a father and two sons and other laborers. Jesus comes upon James and John, the sons of Zebedee, mending their nets. And Jesus calls to them as well and says, leave your nets Leave your father, leave your livelihood and all that you've known, and follow me. Follow me. Jesus calls and they follow, with the promise that they will become fishers of people, that they will gather others to follow this teacher along with them. And this theme of following and of sharing news is central to our Christian story. In some sense, part of being a follower of the Jesus way is about gathering others to follow Christ with us. It's about hearing and sharing good news as we have received it, news that brings life and hope and peace. And it's not a word often spoken in our mainline tradition, but it's what we call evangelism. It is to share good news. That is what we are called to as followers of Jesus. Now, I'm probably the least qualified person to talk with you about fishing. If you want to talk about salmon or steelhead, you'd be much better off to talk to my brother-in-law. But I know this, there is a huge difference between fishing with nets and fishing with lures. A lure is designed to entice a certain kind of fish to bite on the hook. It's a specialized kind of entrapment. A net, on the other hand, is indiscriminate in what it gathers together. And that's one of the reasons why sea trawling is so controversial. These massive nets that drag along the bottom of the sea collect all kinds of marine life instead of just the kind of fish that you want to sell, just the kind of fish that there's a market for. 
These are very damaging to ecosystems. These are not the kind of nets, however, that the disciples had at their disposal. Archaeologists tell us that the kinds of nets the disciples had were much as many fishermen today have in undeveloped or underdeveloped nations. They were modest in size, hand-woven, designed to be cast by hand out over a school of fish or placed where fish might gather and then pulled up by hand. Depending on the size of the fish, they might gather a few or a few hundred. When Jesus tells them to follow and I will make you fish for people, this metaphor is meant to describe neither the entrapment nor the enchantment of people through the powers of persuasion, but the sharing of good news. And through that sharing, the gathering together of people who need to see and hear and experience good news in their life. That is what Jesus calls them to. If you read on in Mark's narrative, Jesus teaches and preaches, but the focus is not upon indoctrination. Rather, the next few encounters with Jesus are stories of liberation, healing, and restoration. They're stories about hope, about those who weren't treated as full people being treated with dignity by Jesus, about people who were pushed to the margins of society instead being brought to the center, about both bodies and souls restored and families being both divided and reunited. The whole point of calling disciples to leave their nets and follow is that they will hear and receive good news and then sharing that liberating good news with others who need to hear it and see it and experience it themselves. If we are to assume that their calling is anything like our own, it means that we are called to be bearers of good news, that we are called to love one another and share the good news that we find with each and every person we encounter, in whatever form that takes. Now you have this story and you contrast it to our second story, the story of Jonah. Here is a fish story of a very different kind, a story in which God tells Jonah to go and to preach a call to repentance. Indeed, that was John's call, was a call to repentance. But for Jonah, instead of answering the call to go and share this message, a message that ultimately ends in good news of repentance and forgiveness for the people of Nineveh, the prophet turns and goes the exact opposite way. To Jonah, the Ninevites were on the other side of the aisle. He doesn't want them to hear good news. He doesn't want them to repent and be forgiven. In this divine call, Jonah is called to love those who he hates. And this is a lesson in this story. What happens to him? What happens to him when he refuses to deliver that divine message? Well, the boat, the storm, the being tossed on the waves and thrown overboard, eaten by a great fish and three days to digest his situation before he's spat out on the shore. This is meant as a kind of morality tale. It's meant to say, look what happens when you choose hate over love, when you choose your own way over obedience to God. Look what happens when you choose resentment over compassion and punishment over justice and peace. Now, to be clear, not every call to repentance is received and answered with repentance. And so if we're really honest, we can understand Jonah's reluctance to do what God instructed. Sometimes people harden their hearts and refuse to repent and turn and go another way. The name Pharaoh comes to mind. But it's also true that very often um, we don't actually want to see our enemies repent and be forgiven. Sometimes we don't even want to offer them that chance because even if their repentance were sincere, we've already lost, lost all trust in them. We've given up hope that they can change 
And sometimes all we want more than anything in the world is the chance to gloat over them when they reach their eventual demise, when we see them suffer the consequences of their ignorance, error, or misdeeds. At our worst moments, we relish the chance to sit in righteous judgment over those we perceive as our enemies instead of hoping for their repentance, healing, restoration, and forgiveness. Now, lest you think I'm a better person than I actually am, I confess, I don't want to sit down with white Christian nationalists, with neo-chauvinists, and try to convince them why they are wrong, wrong about our nation's history. It exhausts me to even think about it. And on one level, I actually find it somewhat unrealistic to believe that some of these people will change. As Maya Angelou famously said, when people show you who they are, you should believe them the first time. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes, every once in a great while, people change. People actually change. Sometimes hearts are softened by the loving and gentle witness of another. And a miracle happens. A transformation begins. And when that happens, that can only be the work of God. Sometimes someone speaks truth in love to us, and that gentle word breaks through all of our defenses, finds a soft place in our hearts. And by nothing but the grace of God, our heart and mind is changed. As a self-professed Christian, this I believe. Change is possible. Or I should say, I believe, I believe, oh God, help me overcome my unbelief. What I wonder today is, how does this happen? How does change happen? How can we help it to happen today in the here and the now? Madeline Langle, author of A Wrinkle in Time, once wrote, We draw people to Christ not by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. That is the kind of evangelism that I believe we're called to. Not to knock on doors and hand out tracts, not to post the Ten Commandments on a wall in the courthouse and declare ours a Christian nation, rather to show light so lovely that others want to know the source of it. As someone once said, don't fight the darkness, bring the light, and the darkness will disappear. I believe that. And friends, make no mistake, the call of God is not for the faint of heart. This light shining is hard work. For it's the work of engaging and listening to, loving and forgiving our enemies. It means seeing them as people very much like us, even when they would see us as, as less than a person. Today, I'm trying to figure out how to do that in practical terms. And so I want to bring this down to a very basic, a real-life situation. For a moment, don't think about it in terms of sharing your faith or your religious convictions or of arguing your personal political views. Think instead of sharing good news in terms of sharing facts and information about a life-giving vaccine with a friend, family member, or neighbor who is perhaps skeptical about the safety or effectiveness of such vaccines. A recent poll said that four in 10 Americans have said that they won't get a coronavirus vaccine. Four in 10. Does that surprise you? Perhaps it shouldn't, but it surprises me. There will always, of course, be those who disbelieve in science and the advances of modern medicine. But in a nation as advanced as ours, a country known for its groundbreaking medical advances, a country that has helped eradicate diseases like polio, that here, 
Nearly half of our population is skeptical about the safety and efficacy of a vaccine. Well, that both saddens and astonishes me. And so among other things that I want to be evangelical about, I've been wondering about how to be an evangelist for both vaccines and vaccinations, because it's not done till it's all done, right? If you know what I mean, two shots and a few more weeks to let your body build up an immunity, and then you have protection. Well, there's a lot of disinformation out there on the internet about vaccines and in general, but unfortunately in the political polarization of this moment, there are some who are skeptical about the speed at which newly released vaccines have been developed, even though they have been proven to be 94 to 95% effective. And that is almost as effective as our world's most effective vaccine, the vaccine for measles, which is 97% effective. Now there are some who aren't recommended to take these vaccines, of course. Children and pregnant women, for instance. Some who have certain immune conditions that would not allow them uh, or these would not be effective for them. But friends, we, in the privileged, developed world, have not one but two, two life-saving vaccines. And most of us are eligible and are recommended to take these. And so why is it that so many are reluctant to get the shot? Why, when more Americans have died from COVID-19 over the last year, the last 12 months, than died through all the years of World War II. Just let that sink in. More than 400,000 have been lost to this virus. And we have not one but two vaccines proved highly effective based on well-proven mRNA vaccine development techniques. And even we have, even if we have enough doses, even if we can distribute them all, there's still a large portion of our nation's population that's skeptical and refuses to get their shot. I wonder, is there any hope of changing these kinds of hearts and minds? I confess a part of me wants to, to shake people sometimes. Part of me wants to say, okay, I guess we let natural selection do what it does best. Much as we want to, at times, the call of God and basic human morality will not allow me or any of us to just give up on such folks. In fact, if we have learned anything during the past year of this pandemic, it's that we're all connected. What affects one of us affects us all. And so we are all called and commissioned to share life bringing good news with all those in need. And that's a whole lot of people. Sometimes people we fundamentally disagree with. Thankfully, public health experts have some advice on how to effectively reach through to people who might be skeptical about vaccines. What they tell us is that we should not try to begin with condemnation or criticism. We should instead ask people about their questions and their concerns and be curious. Then we can offer to help them find answers from trusted sources, come alongside them in researching their questions. We should talk about our, our own personal feelings and concern for them or ourselves, or our family members, and outline the possible consequences about not getting vaccinated. Lastly, they say, you know, naturally we are all a little selfish. We're not very good at thinking about what's in the, the public, public's best interest, but we do think about what's in our own personal best interest. And so we can appeal to that. Public health is not and should not be a political issue, and yet in this moment, it has become one. If we are to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, we have to learn to talk with one another about the things that matter. We have to learn how to speak our truth, how to disagree, and sometimes fundamentally, and still listen to one another, to still make room for our own need for repentance and forgiveness, and even as we hope for that for our enemies, the call to discipleship is a call to become bearers of good news wherever we go and with whomever we meet. I close with a few words from 
a young woman we should all know by now, Amanda Gorman, 22 years old. She is the youngest inaugural poet in U.S. history. But this calm, confident, and eloquent, inspiring young woman may be the Maya Angelou of her generation. And in her poem, delivered at the inauguration, the poem entitled, The Hill We Climb, she delivered this word of hope. She said, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. There is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So as we continue through this season of Epiphany, this season of light made manifest, my prayer is that we will be brave enough to answer the call to love God and love one another, that we will be light. Will you pray with me? Holy One, hold us gently in this time of turmoil and uncertainty. Remind us of the everyday blessings of each new day, of sunshine and rain, wind and clouds, your presence is as sure as the ground beneath us. Help us be rooted in you and to reach toward the sun, to stretch beyond what is in front of us now, to know your warmth and grace are within us, empowering us to share good news with all in need. May your spirit move in us, reminding us that we are not alone. and We, have, we were created to be with one another that you bless the diversity of your creation of which all people are a part. And so we pray, grant us assurance in this season. Be with us and let your light live in us, O oh God. Amen. to a time in our service when we lift up our prayers to God.
prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of petition. This is a public video, but we want to invite you to add your prayers to the comments and the chat alongside of the video so we can all pray together. But if you have a private prayer request or a request that is especially sensitive, I invite you to email it to me or go to our website and submit it there through the homepage uh, prayer request uh, option. But now I invite us to join together in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. God of all people, we pray today for people highly placed in power. We pray that they may seek truth and the common good and the peace that can only come through justice. We pray that they may have courage and character in striving to heal the divisions of our world. We pray for those who bless with their lips, even as they curse with their mouths, including ourselves. Teach us humility and grace that we may truly love one another as ourselves. Help us believe in your power to transform. We pray for your blessing upon those who labor on behalf of others. Watch over those who endanger themselves and their families to provide for and protect those who are strangers. We thank you for scientists and public health officials, for doctors, nurses, and grocery store attendants. We thank you for bus drivers and school teachers. We pray for those who care. We pray for our children and those who are just beginning life that they will live to see brighter days. We pray for those who are ill and those facing the end of life. Give them the gift of prayer and presence, that they may always be able to pour out their hearts to you. We pray for the church and its leaders, that we may hear and respond to your call to love and compassion, that we might believe in faith, and shine light so enticing that others are drawn closer, ever closer to you. Rock of our salvation, we confess we don't want things to go back to normal. For normal wasn't good enough for so, so very many. Instead, through Christ and your Holy Spirit, we pray, bring us into the new world that you are shaping, even as this world is passing away. Now, in a moment of silence, we lift up to you those prayers which are nearest and dearest to our hearts this day, knowing that you hear and you will answer according to your wisdom and your grace. And now, as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into a time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our invitation to offering. Gestures of gratitude or demonstration that a blessing or benefit has been received. We heard a call, dropped our nets, and came to this place to find new life. The gifts we give today are but tokens of the blessings of the new life we live in Christ. Bring your gifts with joy, for they remind us of just how blessed we are to know this love that flows so generously from the Spirit of God. Thank you.
May these gifts given to these ministries of grace be a blessing to friends and strangers, those like us and those not, those deserving and those not. For in this way, the love of God reaches all of God's beloved. Amen. now receive this blessing and benediction. Now may the one who is faithful to all be with us all as we depart this blessed time. May we be a blessing to everyone in every place we go until we gather again. Go now in the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go now in peace to love and serve our God. Amen.